Mr. Wilson, are we live? However, we have a background up crew.
Okay. Meeting come to order. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, those joining us tonight. Um, let us stand for uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please, in a moment of silence, if you'd like to join us. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. America, you know, which stands. Justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Terry, roll call, please. Mrs. Fish. Dr. Gatachu. Mr. Gordon. Dr. Gursky. Should be joining us. Okay. Mr. Kirsch. Here. Mr. Reichard. Here. Dr. Uasa. Here. Mrs. Edmeads. Mr. Huron. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, just for the record, we did have uh, an executive session this evening. Uh, where we did discuss several personnel related issues that meeting started at six and ended promptly a minute or two before seven that's 658 for the record okay so first order of business is our meeting minutes from january 6th so i have a motion to approve the meeting minutes thank you daryl do i have a second second thank you Two voice okay all in favor aye 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 all opposed, Aye. no. Okay, motion carries, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also, I guess we did, we did redo the individual minutes. I guess we should do them individually. That was for the January 6th. Do I have another motion just to be um, clear for the January 13th? I'm sorry, I should have packaged those. Uh, meeting minutes for January 13th. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes as well? Thank you, Gerald. Do I have a second, please? Thank you, Bonnie. All in favor, voice is a aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. And all opposed, no. Okay, that motion carries as well. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right, so. Next order of business is our board administrative announcements. We'll start with um, the reports. Uh, Columbia Montour um, Vote Tech, which is, uh, I'm on that board. Uh, the primary focus we had this last week was we had the first read of the budget and the audit that was conducted for that um, uh, uh, entity, and that went very well. And the budget is, is being reviewed by all board members and, um, and further action will occur in subsequent meetings. That, that was the highlights of um, the VOTEC team. Um, CSIU is Dr. Katachu, who is unable to make it tonight. I think he'd probably be the best one to speak on that. Um, board Building and grounds with uh, Mr. Reichert. Um, did you want to make a comment on where we are there? Anything to add for the... On too, please. They're also a virtual team can hear us. Uh, during that presentation for the uh, grounds committee, we had interviewed uh, people who do a feasibility study for our school district. That's where we're at with that. Okay. Great, awesome. And then athletic committee, Kyle's not here tonight. Did, um, is there anything for? Chris, I'll look over you for a moment real quick. Is there anything that you'd want to share at this moment on the, on the athletic committee? Thanks. Okay. 
and things are going well with the athletic um, committee also. Okay, um, next order of business is, uh, we did the committee updates, at least funny. Um, enrollment report, Dr. Boyle, please. All right, enrollment at the district is maintaining with, at the primary building, we have 600 students total, which includes 81 pre-K Head Start students. At the high school, we have 642 students. At Liberty Valley, we're at 510. And at the middle school, we have 492 attending in the buildings. We also have, uh, for the DASD Cyber, which is the Ironman Cyber, we have 162 students who are attending our own cyber school, which is one of those things we really worked on so that we could keep students in the district and keep them from going to outside cyber. We still have 70 students in outside cybers. Homeschool, we have 128 students. And our bridge program, which is a virtual program where the students are at home learning synchronously with the teachers in the teaching from the classroom, that has 333 students across the district. Okay, thank you. All right, I want to say thank you very much to the school board. Uh, January is school director recognition month, and I would like to thank our directors for their hard work and dedication. Uh, Pennsylvania school directors are locally elected officials and volunteer. Uh, they devote at least 10 to 15 hours a month on school board business, and honestly, several do much more. So I'd like to thank you for your service in this challenging time. We have a little presentation for you. Uh, Jeff, yeah, you want to start the, sl the slideshow, the thank you. And I want you to take notice of this bulletin board and this up here, which are thank yous to the board that our students have given you. Excuse me, Dr. Boyle, will there be snacks with this presentation? You got lot breakfast, or supper oh. until you're done. All right, I'll stick with my water, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Amy. Just the, the, what you're seeing here are just a short selection of thank yous from students at Liberty Valley. I will be sending you the full three slides presentations uh, for every student in the building has sent you a thank you card. Wow. And you'll be receiving those. Hopefully I get that done tomorrow morning sometime. What grade is Caden? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, probably fifth, because I went fifth, fourth, third. So probably a fifth grader. Keep rolling, Jeff. Go ahead. This one has a little bit of a graphic for you. Ah. Bye. Go again. This was a true community service type learning activity for these students because now they understand what a school board director does and just how much you get paid. Keep going, Jeff. Okay. Okay. And again, you'll get all these and more. Okay. Her hand is holding up a little heart. Oh. So you know that that's what she's doing. She's giving you love. Hey. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. And he's got a thumbs up for you. Uh oh. 
All right. Thank you, Jeff. Did I, did I hear you say something about get paid? Now they know just how much you do get paid, oh. which is zero. Oh, maybe you guys are holding out a little bit something. <laughs> no, that's why I said it's a community a service lesson, lesson because they now know that you're serving them uh, totally voluntary. That's awesome. So, Mrs. Willoughby, do you want to bring the next portion of our wow. acknowledgement and thank you? Wow. So, here we have a representation of at least three of the buildings. So, we have... Delaney, you're in Liberty Valley. Go ahead. <laughs> we have Just, Madeline, who's in middle school. Go ahead. <laughs> They're very shy. Mia, who is at, also at Liberty Valley, and oh, Zane, who is here um, at Danville Primary. Um, so they're all passing out notes that are um, thank yous from the Danville wow. Primary School. This so they, cool. of course, are handwritten. Thank you. And lots of lovely drawings. And um, any extras I'll take to the other right. members. Cool. Okay, yep, if you want to give them to Dr. Boyle. <laughs> so we just want to thank extend you. our thanks. Um, and, of course, some of the children did things that are posted on the board. And behind Dr. Boyle, there's also right. um, an activity that was done. So thank you. Photo op. Uh-oh. Is your camera? <laughs> no, no, Mrs. Willoughby. Mrs. Willoughby, get in there. <laughs> these are Mrs. Willoughby's children. It was the easiest way to get four Your students there quickly. Family. <laughs> Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you, guys. That's incredible. And now from middle school, high school, Jeff. particularly like about the Danville Area School District is how much they value their students and take into consideration students' mental health, especially during these particularly difficult times. It's very nice to see the school district taking measures to ensure that all students are comfortable and looking after their mental health. I think it's a really great place for education. I really like it because I grew up here. Not much family here. Everyone's really nice and school's really I would say my favorite thing about the Danville High School is the drama club. It's given me a bunch of opportunities to become friends with a whole bunch of people that I didn't think I would ever become friends with. And it's given me opportunities to act on stage, which is something that I really want to do. And just for that, I would say it's the thing that I look forward to every single year and just getting to be part of that is always great. What Thank draws me most at DASD is how passionate and welcoming all the faculty and staff are. No matter the circumstances, especially now dealing with the global pandemic, the teachers have not ceased to continue with the rigorous teaching methods. With the limitations that have resulted from the pandemic, the teachers have ensured to all their students that they will continue in education this year, be that through a screen at home or in person. Their resilience in the face of adversity has created a positive atmosphere for everybody. And as a student attending DASD, I can speak for all my peers when I say thank you. Yeah, it's been really cool and how I got to learn a lot, many more instruments at the school. They're doing a great job of teaching me, and I think it's a great school in general. My favorite thing about the DASD is that they are able to offer the students of its school many academic opportunities in various fields of study, things like welding all the way up to things like high-level mathematics. I think the middle school is a great place and the teachers are very great educators and not only do they educate us, they help us with our side things as well. Hi Danville staff, um, the thing I appreciate most about Danville High School is you actually, I know it sounds cheesy but it's true, without you none of this would be happening. Thank you so much. It's small and it's cool. 
favorite part about our school district is the sense of community and how everyone's come together, especially in these hard times. And I also really appreciate all the support of faculty and staff who've been there for all of the students throughout these really rocky times. I like the people here and the teachers. What I like the most about TS80 is the fact that it is able to make such a changes so quickly and adapt the new normal these days to continue our education system. Like in this time during COVID-19, DS80 being able to make such drastic changes has made students like me be able to get educated the way I want. Like during summer, I used to watch school board meeting videos on YouTube with my parents to get the plans you guys were making for this year's education. And this your efforts on this, including the plans, are very effective and it is helping students like me so much. So really, this kind of thing proves that DSAD is changing its landscape of education. I really, really appreciate all of the efforts of this board members, including Dr. Boyle. So thank you so much for all your efforts and making this happen. And making it very nice for us. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Olivia Hoshman and I'm an ninth grader. I want to thank you for always putting the health and safety of the students and staff first. I know the decisions you make can be difficult when taking everyone's circumstances into consideration. Allowing students to have a choice in the course of education gives them some independence, which is what they strive for. Even though we are not in school, it is nice to be able to see our classmates and learn to the best of our abilities over virtual meetings. Thank you for doing a thankless job. Those, these are the moments that make every minute and every time there's a glimmer of frustration, which is hardly ever. <laughs> Working as, as part of a board team. That's, that's what it's all about. I mean, that right there, right here, is what it's about. It's about the kids. That's it. It boils down after everything else and the visions and everything, all that stuff. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And that's, that's awesome. So thank you. And thank you very much for all you guys are doing. A um, couple more things. The, we did put in for a food service grant. I think it was about March or April. I'm not sure anymore. It just seems like so long ago. Oh, it might have even been October or something. I don't know. It's been a while. Anyway, um, we put in for a food service grant for a walk-in refrigerator at the Danville Middle School, which we're not even sure is an original to the building, and I'm not even thinking about how old that building is. Uh, we did receive a grant for $49,005 to put that in. So I'm wow. pretty excited about that. It was one of those things that Danville has never gotten. Um, and there are 300 applications that they accepted, and only 59 districts got any money from them. That's awesome. So, Great news. All right, Jeff, the presentation, please. One of the questions that was asked at the end of the last meeting was how do we make these decisions? Because they are very time consuming, very difficult, and I can honestly say many times heart wrenching for me. So I've decided to give a decision making process so that the public and the board can understand, um, at least try to understand what the process is like. The first thing we have to do with all the Department of Health and PDE regulations is consider the level of community transmission. Next. This is the chart that they have provided for us to follow. And as you can see, there are three levels, low, moderate, and substantial. What we look at is basically two areas, the incident rate per 100,000 residents in the county. And in our case, we look at Montour County, and I'll be honest, I look at Northumberland County as well, but we base from what the state requires, I need to base everything on the Montour County numbers. And then we also look at the percentage of positivity in the most recent days. So the incident of rate per 100,000, if it's less than 10, 10, individual 10, not by number, then it is low. From 10 to 100, 10 to 99 actually, it is moderate, and then anything over 100 
is substantial. And then, of course, they look at the, the other rates for moderate and low, or moderate and substantial, it's either or. You can't, it doesn't have to be both in those categories. And as you can see, their recommended style of instructional model, which is starting to change a little bit, but right now they're still looking at a bland, blended model for every area and a full remote uh, model as well. They want you to choose between those two. They have changed that substantial where they said you could have a blended model at elementary only or a full remote learning model at the secondary. Now please understand that's not the models we are using, but because of the signature that we've put on the attestation form and the assurances that uh, Mr. Huron and I have given the state that we will follow all of the rules regarding masking, social distancing, uh, case count, those things, we're assuring that we will do what the state is asking us to do. And if there are issues, we will follow the guidelines. So that's why we're getting a little bit less restrictive than what they want us to be. Next. Uh, board members, you do have a copy of this because it didn't come out real well on here. But every week, every Friday afternoon, this comes out for every county. This one is specific to Montour County. And as you can see, the first number has to do with the newly reported confirmed cases. And they, they do adjust these every week, even after the fact, because in Montour County, sometimes the numbers aren't quite right. These are the adjusted numbers. The 144 were for the previous week. The 139 were for the most recent week, ending um, the 22nd of January. So that 139 might be a different number come next week, but it'll probably be pretty close. And then you go to the second number. The second number is that number that has to be below 10, 10 to 99, or above 100 and above. And as you can see in our case, the, the cases per 100,000 people is up in the 700s. So that puts us into the substantial level. It's either that one or the next one. And the next one, the same thing. If it's between above 10%, then we're in substantial, which that's at 21.9. So both cases were at substantial. So it doesn't matter either way. You know, we have to follow what they expect for substantial. Next. This one's going to be a little hard to see, and I apologize. But what it is is both Northumberland and uh, Montour County. The Montour County bar is in the light blue, and the Northumberland is in the white. And I started it the week that we started school. So the week ending of September 4th is all the way to the from what way I'm looking at it to the right. What that shows us is the first two weeks of school, we were in the moderate level, and so was Northumberland County. The next two weeks, we were at low in Montour County. Uh, and then we started in substantial for the next four weeks. Then the following two, we were in moderate, and then we were in substantial. Now, every week since October 10th, the week ending October 10th, I have been notified by the state that we were in substantial or moderate and what they would guide us to do. And their guidelines were to be in full remote. And as you can see throughout that entire time, although we went to hybrid in the high school, we maintained in person as long as we possibly could. Because in um, November 24th, they came out with new guidelines and that attestation form. That form holds us at a higher level of accountability. Uh, and they were, you know, the state basically said because people were not doing what they wanted them to do, that they were putting this in place to assure that things were happening in the way they expected them to happen. So that's where we're at. So that week ending of the 27th, actually on the 19th of November, we started with a hybrid at the middle school, and then we closed for those weeks between um, November 21st, I think it was, all the way through to the 15th of January. And as you can see, in all those weeks, we were substantial. The board made the decision to go forward beginning on the 20th, the, the 18th, the weekend, that green bar is where we switched 
to be uh, open again with hybrids in both the middle and high school and in person at the elementary. Now we do have a hybrid in that we have so many bridge students out of the building, but parents want to see their kids in the building. We know that and we want that too, but we still have to be mindful of the expectations and the requirements. So we've returned to the, the models of um, hybrid at the secondary and in person with a bridge model at the elementary although that's not what the recommendations are. So that, again, that attestation form, uh, Mr. Huron and I had to re-sign it and state that now we're gonna have students in the building, this is what we're now gonna follow. So a lot of the decisions we make are based on what the guidelines were given and told to follow. Next. So the next step in the process is comparing the cases in the building with the recommendations for a medium-sized school. A medium-sized school is between 500 and 900 students, and all of our buildings fall in that range. They came out with what was called the rolling 14-day period, and that means that within 14 days, if you get a certain number, do you want to go to the next one, Jeff, because they can see it then? Within 14 days, if you get a certain number of cases, then you have guidelines of what you have to do. So in this situation, when you're, the rolling period begins on the date of that first positive case that you get in, the, in a building, and that has to be someone who has attended or participated in extracurricular activities. Even if they're a student who's e-learning but they're playing on a basketball team, it counts. Uh, and, and then also if the uh, individuals that, you know, a case, and I'll, I'll go over that in a minute, but... So when you have these cases and that we count them, um, it goes over a 14 day period. But if you get, say I get four cases in a building, which was happened at the high school the first day we came back. We closed for a day. Now, if you look at that under this middle column, they tell us that we should close for three to seven days, but they have that little red asterisk that little red asterisk gives us some wiggle room that if, if we get through all our contact tracing, if we get through a deep clean of the building and have everybody out of the building for a period of time, we are able to open in a shorter period of time. So I've always tried to, to minimize the amount of time we close because of cases. And you can see that you know as the numbers go up, it makes it more difficult. But once I close that building, my case is back down to a zero. But it goes by building because, you know, it can't be the whole district unless, like yesterday, we were closed the whole day. We could clean all the buildings. I could back us down again. All right. Um, next. Thank you. The other thing, the next thing we had to do is we had to look at closure. If the case warranted to be closure, we had to, like I said, clean the buildings, um, and keep them closed for a designated time. One of the things that we have at Danville is we have three uh, absolutely fantastic, wonderful, top of the notch, I can't say enough good things about our three certified school nurses. They all took it upon themselves this summer to go to attend the John Hopkins training on contact tracing. That has enabled us to do a great deal of everything that needs to be done in-house and much more quickly than if we would be waiting for the Department of Health like other districts have to. Uh, the Department of Health has given our nurses the go-ahead because they have seen the quality of work we have, and without them, we would be in dire straits, let me tell you. So in this case, uh, we look at it. If a case, yeah, case investigations, contact tracing, cleaning and disinfecting, if they can be accomplished in a shorter period of time, we don't have to keep it out as many days. Go ahead. The last slide happens to be uh, our current status, all right? Cases are people who have been infected with the virus that causes COVID, and that's where we get notification of a positive result. So the cases in red, the numbers in red, if you can see that, are the ones that we have had in our buildings that have had a positive result. The ones with the two asterisks and that are in blue are called probable. Probable cases meet the criteria uh, 
clinical criteria and then also have a linkage to someone in their household that is positive. So what happens to us is we'll have a parent report that they are positive, they're keeping their child home to quarantine them, but that then automatically puts them in that case number of being a probable case. CDC, Department of Health have told us that cases are both those that are positive and those that are probable, not just those that are quarantined. And shockingly, this is gonna put a lot of people in total surprise, as of today, we had 47 students quarantined at the high school. They don't count on our case. They're ones that have been in contact or exposed in one way or another. The other buildings all have people out as well. We have staff out. Note at the very bottom is our maintenance department has now been impacted where we have one positive case and two others that are out because they've been in close contact. So as you can see, this is a rolling thing that keeps us going. Like I said, I took yesterday as an opportunity. Our staff are very good. Our custodians are very good at cleaning everything every day. They wipe down the door handles. They all, what's they're called touch points. They manage all that. So yesterday they went through all their areas and cleaned. That gave me a restart, which I'm grateful for because had it not, I would have been closing three buildings today. So it, when a building is closed, it is, absolutely necessary to close it because of the Department of Health, CDC, and PDE guidelines. Do I have any questions? No, no comments? Questions? No. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Boyle. You're welcome. Okay, next order of business tonight is our public comment period. Um, the public comment is open for individuals to have three minutes to comment on agenda items only at this point. And if you would like to make a public comment, please state your name and address, and then you're welcome to share um, your public comment. And we'll start with folks in the room, which we have a small group, and I don't see anybody starting to walk towards the microphone. So I'll turn it over to Jeff out in virtual world. Jeff, is there anybody out there that'd like to share a public comment, please? Please raise your hand if you want to make public comment. No public comment at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving along through our agenda tonight, we have um, a group here from KCBA who will do a feasibility study presentation for us. Um, I don't know if anybody want to set the set the framework of of these folks. Yeah, I'd be happy to. All right, um, we have we have gone through the process of interviewing several groups, architects uh, that we were considering to do our feasibility study. At this time, we're asking KCBA to present to our school board, and we'll do a final vote on February tenth regarding exactly, um, you know, awarding the actual feasibility study to the group uh, as far as it votes. But this group had definitely uh, gave us a great deal of information. We liked a lot of their ideas, their flexibility, and their willingness to work with us uh, and listen to what we had to say. So we appreciated that. And if I could just maybe share one quick framework, because it's kind of a, an evolution that we've been working on a, as an entity for a little bit. The feasibility studies intent is to take a look, a uh, like a look at the the condition of our facilities, the the condition of the school the school district as it applies to our facilities, and then working with with these folks in this case to take a look at where we where we might need to go, where we have some opportunity, what the school district could look like down the road, and 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 all the things associated with that. So we're at the front end of moving forward in, in that process. So hopefully that. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Dr. Boyle, uh, for having us here tonight. Um, we're very excited to just quickly go through a couple of things about ourselves so you guys get to know us a little bit, some of the projects uh, that we feel were um, prevalent and very uh, uh, similar to, to what we're going to be uh, jumping into the study here for. Um, my name is, uh, let's see if that'll turn, it's going to go slow. Um, Michael Kelly, I'm the principal uh, at uh, KCBA Architects. I'll be one of your lead designers and main contact throughout the study. 
Hello, uh, I'm Jim Kiefer. Uh, I'm a project manager at KCBA. I've been working at KCBA for over 20 years. Uh, my role on the project would be to be the main day-to-day -day person managing the entire project, uh, organizing all the information, talking to all the consultants, and getting all the information from the district. Hi, my name is Jamie Bortz. I'm a project coordinator with KCBA. I've been with KCBA for five years. I have over eight years of experience in the field. Um, I've worked on a lot of feasibility studies with our, our firm and um, would do a lot of coordination internally within our office as well as with Jim and Mike. Perfect, thanks. This was um, uh, a team that we had put together because we've worked on a lot of these projects um, over the years. We've done a lot of different studies that we're gonna share some of those with you today. So this will be the consistent team throughout the study, consistent team hopefully throughout maybe a potential uh, building project and throughout construction as well. So we're gonna be with you from beginning to end. We can answer all of those questions in the field because we were here at the very first meeting as we, as we spoke a little bit earlier tonight. Uh, we're even providing our, our cell phone numbers there. Um, if you guys need to contact us anytime, we're happy to, uh, to talk and review. Um, a couple of things that we think separate us from uh, some of the other competition in, in Pennsylvania. First is our experience. Uh, KCBA has been around for almost 50 years. Uh, we have over 300 K-12 projects in Pennsylvania. This is what we do. Our main focus is education. We are an education uh, architectural firm. Um, so we have a lot of studies and a lot of uh, partners that we can share uh, some of those success stories with you. Our resources, we have uh, 40 people in our office. We have structural engineers, interior designers, uh, code specialists. We have a lot of different entities um, within our own uh, four walls. Uh, we have a lot of uh, innovative design tools. Some of those things you'll see tonight. A lot of computer graphics and things like that that help tell the story, help you understand the designs and, and options that we may be sharing. And lastly, and I think is most important, is our dedication. We do not charge for additional meetings. We're here all the time. Ken called us uh, last week, said, hey, come to the board meeting, jumped in the car and we're here. Um, we're all coming out of the, the Lehigh Valley office there, so we're not too far. Um, we think meetings are great. We think more meetings are better. Um, that way we're really understanding your district because the solutions we come with are going to be unique to you uh, for what's best uh, for, your, uh, for your district and, and specifically for your students. As I mentioned, we have some good uh, local experience. We're currently working uh, just down 80 there at, at uh, uh, Bloomsburg. Uh, we have a lot of experience, like I said, really throughout Pennsylvania from the northern side all the way out west as well. Uh, recently completed a, a project in Altoona. Um, some recent facility studies uh, just in the last few years. Uh, this is kind of the, the season of feasibility study. A lot of school districts, as, as the economy was turning there, is looking to um, what's next? How can we improve our facilities? Uh, what can we do to maybe find some ways to consolidate, some ways to become more efficient, uh, energy efficient? Uh, so there's a lot of studies that we've worked with with a lot of your uh, uh, fellow school districts throughout the state. Um, as I mentioned, we're very involved in public schools. Uh, we're involved in a lot of uh, state, local, and even national organizations that, that talk a lot about K-12 initiatives, where trends are going, where uh, new learning spaces may be. Um, we're involved in a lot of advocacy as well. This is, um, uh, I was asked to testify at a Senate hearing about plan con funding, which we're still trying to get turned back on. Um, and uh, so again, it just kind of shows our, our dedication to that. Um, we were pretty close last spring, I think, about getting that back on until uh, COVID hit. Um, but again, um, when we're not in the office, we're advocating for public education uh, it's something that we're very passionate about. Uh, Jim and I have done a lot with uh, school security as well. Uh, Jim is certified in DEPHED, which is Criminal Protection Through Environmental Design. Ah, got it. Um, and uh, I was asked to be on uh, the governor's uh, school safety committee, that group for the Act 44 funds that send out all that money to you. That's, I'm one of the many people on that, uh, uh, on that committee. What's really nice is, is it really provides um, uh, a lot of great discussion, a lot of great ideas on school security, which will certainly be one of our top priorities uh, as we look at uh, your facilities and part of the study. Um, go ahead. If I could just maybe sure. the, explain to me real brief, what is PlanCon? PlanCon is, or I should say was, the reimbursement um, factors for the state to help reimburse um, partially for school construction. 
So in the past, um, if you were going to do a school project, uh, as long as it was a building that you hadn't touched in 20 years and it met certain criteria, the uh, state would, would provide some funding, not all, you know, maybe sometimes it's 5%, maybe sometimes it's a little more, but there, was, there were dollars that the state would provide. Back in about 2013, um, they stopped that. Um, they turned it back on for about five minutes and then turned it back off. So right now you can build whatever you want, um, but the school is, uh, or uh, Plan Con, or the PDE rather, the state, is not helping financially uh, at all with that, un unfortunately. Okay. Um, we, sorry, we are receiving some Plan Con money for um, past construction projects, but like you said, nothing recent. Yes, they had, they had actually stopped paying for a while, so there was a big backlog. So how they solved that was they said, all right, from this day forward, we're not doing that anymore. They took out a gargantuanly big loan and are now paying everybody for past projects. So I'm sure this building and, and some of the other work you may have done, you are now finally being paid for that, but they've got a while before they pay that loan back off. So um, again, you can still build the buildings that you want. You can still do the work that you'd like to do. Um, it's unfortunately the additional funds that the state were providing are no longer available. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, energy efficiency experts, we have quite a lot of uh, projects that are considered LEED accredited projects and whether you're going for certification, certification, uh, whether you're going for certification or just that's something that you're very interested in, we're very passionate about that as well. I'm a LEED accredited professional, so we've got, uh, again, some expertise in our office on uh, green and sustainable design. Um, so as I mentioned, we're doing projects all over the state. Uh, a couple of active projects that we thought were nice to show um, because we're looking here at a variety of different schools. We're currently building a new elementary, a new middle, a new high school. We're also currently renovating an elementary, a middle, and a high school. Um, so we're coming in with really no preconceived notions of anything. It may be a, a series of new or additions and renovations. We have experience in, in all of those uh, construction types um, and, and options for your school improvements. Um, one of the things everybody always asks is about uh, project cost control. These are just a couple of projects that we did just recently and actually even during um, uh, basically since last spring. Um, all projects that were, um, in this case, new, new construction and then Aeronomic was uh, a renovation project. All of them, most importantly, coming in under budget. So cost control uh, is something that we're, we take very, very seriously, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, and something that we have a very good track record of, of staying on top of. Um, so we wanted to share uh, three projects with you um, that we thought were um, very similar to, as I mentioned, some of the things that, that I saw when we did the walkthrough a few weeks ago, um, when you brought everybody kind of through, uh, quickly through the schools just to, to take a look. Uh, Jim and Jamie and I kind of sat down and said, you know, started talking about a couple of projects and. We each kind of grabbed one that we thought was uh, uh, similar and, and had some characteristics that uh, would be important to share with you. So Jim, take us off. All right, um, I'm gonna talk to you about Penn's Valley. <clears throat> this was a project that uh, Mike and I worked on. Uh, we did a study for them. They're a relatively small district. Uh, they're the district just east of State College. Um, they have three buildings. And they had a lot of needs at their high school. Their high school is actually junior high and high school combined. Um, they had a limited budget. So the, the task here was, how can we stretch those dollars? How can we get the most bang for your buck out of what they needed to do? While at the same time, really hitting the, the, the really important things that they wanted to tackle. Um, this is a shot. This was when you came in the front door of the high school, this is the first thing you saw was a carter and lockers. It wasn't the most, um, exciting entrance into a building. Um, and this is the same area that has, was transformed. Um, one of the things that they really wanted to add was some collaboration space for their high school students. They really didn't have anywhere in the building to do that. So that was a space they desired. We thought it was a great idea to put that right up front. We wanted to put that on display. We wanted to make an impression when you came in the building, give it a new fresh look sort of project forward, this is where this district is going. This is where the high school is the direction that they're going. So strategically placing that at the front of the building was, was a key goal. 
Uh, this was their library. Um, they really had an old, outdated library. They wanted to convert to a, a modern media center. Um, we converted this space into what you see here. Um, not just freshening it up, but adding zones within the room, adding spaces where there could be acoustic separation if a small group of students wanted to break out and use those collaboration rooms that are on the side, but yet still be visible by the librarian to monitor everything that was going on. Um, this really gave them those opportunities. Another big component was their arts program. They had a, uh, a 1960s auditorium. Um, this is what it looked like before. And this is the refresh. Um, a lot of what went into here was new systems, new sound system, new lighting system, a new acoustic system. Um, and that really transforms that they're now a state of the art auditorium and they could deliver the arts in the way that they wanted to in the district. This was the front door of the school. Uh, came in, administration was on the right. Um, it was a very nondescript entry. There were security issues with that. This is what we transformed it into. We really wanted to an announce that entrance, make it clear to visitors where to go. Um, raising the roof, bringing glass. Um, we wanted the glass there for transparency. We want uh, for security. The, the receptionist to be able to see who's coming up to the building and monitor everybody that's coming in and out. We built a secure vestibule. We also expanded the administrative space and the guidance space that they needed. And we did it all at that location. Uh, Jamie's gonna talk now about uh, restructuring and grade, grade alignments. This is another project that we did for another district um, at the intermediate level. No, the building was open the entire time. Um, a renovation project like that, one of the key components is figuring out the design of the phasing. It really influences the entire project. How do we keep the kids' uh, education going and keep them safe at the same time? So working out what pieces, what pieces of the pie you move, when you move them, how the dominoes all fall, that's a really complicated process that we do to figure out how to keep the kids safe keep school going I have one more quick quick question if it's not the right time to answer it but like on that that building you showed some nice before and afters Did, was there also a financial analysis on the energy part of it before and after like what like a, a relative sense of we we did these changes and now our energy bills are 20 percent more 20 percent less is that part of that scope or is it well the right form for that discussion we didn't specifically do that analysis, although I, I'm sure if I talk to Bob Miller, the facilities director there, we can get that information. Right. I was just um, curious because it's a big we, we added about 10%. We increased the building about 10%. So most of the existing buildings stayed. Now, all the classrooms got new uh, unit ventilators. So there was definitely an efficiency gain in all the classrooms by doing that. It's not a very glamorous part of the project, but it made a huge difference in the acoustics in the room and the performance of the mechanical system in, in all the classrooms. Now, what the exact dollar savings on that, that's I can okay. we can find that out. That's, that's all right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I actually have two stories, uh, two different districts that I wanted to present to you guys today um, that specifically talked about um, grade realignment. We did feasibility studies with these two districts um, that resulted in construction projects. Uh, so the first one uh, I want to talk about is Avon Grove School District. This is down towards Philadelphia. Um, we came with a feasibility study for this district. They had three elementary schools, all K through six, uh, seven to eight middle school, and a nine to 12 high school. The elementary schools, two of them were over capacity and aging and condition. The middle school um, was fine and the high school was fine, but those were the two big issues at the, the elementary school. So, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, so trying to um, you know, what, what could be the new configuration to solve this problem? So the answer that we gave to them after going through iteration, iteration was let's create a K center at one of the elementary schools and bring that down to K to two, you know, these little kindergartners, they need a safe place to be. I have a 14 month old son thinking about him going to kindergarten is terrifying to me. So, you know, having a little spot for them is nice. 
Um, this helped alleviate capacity at the other two schools, which we were able to get condense into one large school that became the three to six intermediate center. Then the, the middle school and the high school stayed the same. Um, we were able to achieve this on the same campus. So K through uh, intermediate are on the same location, the same area. They have the same environment every day, starting from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade. So this is showing the site plan and where we have the K center edition on Penn London. This is an image of that center. You know, it's bright, it's colorful, you know, it's playful, um, really a home for these little, little kids who are so influential at that age. The intermediate school, we were able to house, you know, every, there's four, four grades there of students. So how do we play on that and how do we create individual spaces for them? So we created these individual school houses in each wing. So each grade had their own wing and it was able to tailor to the, ed, the educational model that they needed because third graders are a lot different than the sixth graders and especially in scale because at that sixth grade, they're transitioning into the high school or the middle school, sorry. Um, they, they liked us, they hired us back. We just, uh, we went, put out to bid a new high school for Avon Grove. Um, they moved their existing high school students into the middle school that you're also renovating right now. So they liked us, they hired us back, which was great. Um, case study two uh, is for Lower Moreland Township School District, also another district down towards Philadelphia. Um, there's a smaller district, more, um, very similar to yours. They have one K through five elementary school, a six through eight middle school, and a nine through 12 high school. Um, they had a lot of issues here. Their elementary school is way over capacity. Um, they had just, they had put an addition on 10 years prior, but they were hitting their limits. Um, the, the middle school building itself was very, very old, very aged in condition. Their systems were failing. They didn't have sprinklers and it was on a very tight site that was hard to add on to. Um, the high school, it wasn't conducive to the educational model they wanted. It was built in 1950. It didn't have the flexibility. They wanted to push the STEM programs that they wanted to implement into the, into the school. So we showed them a slew of different options. You know, let's expand elementary school again. Let's renovate and expand the middle school over and over all these different ideas. But the main um, option after we met with the administration, we talked about all these different options and what would work best for them. We even uh, had, you know, we do uh, met with the teachers. We talked to them about what they felt were the needs for the schools, what was working, what was not working at those buildings. Um, we even talked to the kids, you know, they have such a different point of view as well from the teachers. We may have bribed them a little bit with some cookies. Um, so they, you know, they're happy to talk to us, but um, the, the solution we came out of for this, which we felt was best for the school, was let's build a new high school for them. Um, give them what they were looking for at 9th through 12th grade for their STEM program that they wanted to implement here. Um, that building, the high school, old high school building, was larger than the middle school. Let's shift those grades over there. Now they have the space they need to grow in the middle school, and there's the systems that are better than the, the um, aging middle school. And then it's big enough so we can also add fifth grade there so that we alleviated the capacity issues at the elementary school. And the site for the middle, the existing middle school was a little difficult to add on to. It was terraced and they had their main fields there already. So if you demo down the building and you had some parking, now you have a community park with the fields there. So you created another space available to the district. Um, and out of that study, again, I said it was the new high school, and this is a rendering of um, what it is going to look like. It just is going out to bid in a couple weeks. Thanks, Jamie. Yep. Um, so again, there's a lot of similarities in both of those, and I'll, I'll share one final one, um, another uh, similar uh, case study as well. This was a very large district. Um, that had a lot of different uh, elementary schools. They had actually had at 1.10 and consolidated down to eight. Uh, when they did that, they realized that they didn't have room for uh, special education and some of the other things that they wanted to have. So suddenly those remaining eight uh, were very over capacity. Um, they had a, a seven to nine middle school, which was fairly new and in good shape. Um, and they had uh, a high school that was built in the 20s and part of a high school that was built in the 70s. Guess which, guess which one was not doing uh, as well as the other. So the 1920s building, it was decided to essentially replace, but replace that with something large enough that ninth grade could move over to it. 
Um, now we have a, more, a little bit more of a traditional 9 through 12 school. The middle school, which was servicing three grades, was doing great. So if ninth moved out, sixth moved in. Now all of a sudden, all of our elementary schools here become K to fives. So we didn't have to touch them. The middle school, we didn't have to touch. We just moved kid, different kids in. And that high school now became much more able to uh, provide their blended learning, their tech ed, their, their STEM programs and things like that, bring ninth grade in as well. And what was nice here, and again, somewhat similar, um, was we were all on a, uh, this is a bit of an urban context here, but it was all essentially in a um, one large campus. So you had the high school above, it's a little hard to see, uh, in two buildings, an A and a B. The B building was the old building. Uh, a large area in the middle there that was nice uh, for practice fields and athletics. Uh, and then the junior high school uh, in blue there down below. So the idea was to take the B building down and essentially put that in between the older A building and the junior high. And now what we've created is this amazing learning campus. We've got one center that actually was bridged over two uh, roads where we've got a fully functioning brand new high school at the front door. We've got the A building that had the gyms and the pools and the cafeterias and some of the science classrooms and things like that. But right in the middle was this very modern um, STEM center set up for um, nine to 12, but with a bridge over uh, for sixth to eighth graders. So they're able to come over, take a look at what's going on, be, be part of these types of spaces. What you're seeing here is uh, an animation that we put together when we were talking to them about some of these newer spaces. We talk about a STEM space. We're replacing a building that's 100 years old. You know, so what do you mean a STEM space? What do you mean a space in the middle of the school where we can fly a drone? They, they, that concept didn't, uh, didn't equate to them, so we wanted to show them what we were talking about, show them what it looked like in this building so that we could have classrooms wrapped around these center spaces. You're seeing here all of these rooms on the left were all science labs. There's one lab here that actually has a balcony for physics that they throw things off of and they do the egg drop challenge and things like that, a little balcony right outside the classroom. It's still enclosed in a space and Pennsylvania gets cold. Um, so we can do this year round. We have outside areas uh, for STEM spaces as well. Uh, very modern, very um, uh, nice school that uh, was certainly better uh, and more efficient than uh, trying to mess with the, the 1920s building um, and providing a, a, a much more uh, modern uh, expression for education in a lot of different spaces for them uh, to explore with their students. So we're ready for your case study. You know, the case study you. We've talked a little bit uh, about with your, with your group earlier tonight about the challenge we have here with, um, again, four, four buildings. Um, this building is great, very nice. Um, you've recently uh, done some work at the high school, obviously the auditorium uh, addition there, which is very nice, all on one campus. Um, the intermediate school, nice school. It's a little bit of a remote location, and we, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges there. Um, and then the middle school building there, which obviously has a few more challenges uh, to it. So there's going to be a lot of different options, a lot of things to consider as we jump in and start looking at these, from renovating to replacing to combining. Um, we're going to show all of those things. We're going to show a couple that we look at, and you're going to go, no, that's not a good idea. Okay, great. But we looked at it. Let's move on. So that when we come to that conclusion, the one that, that we think is going to work best for your students, um, we're that much more confident moving forward because you've looked at multiple options. We didn't just come back with one and go, yep, this is it. You looked at a lot of others. You can stand with, with confidence to say, yeah, I think that's the right one uh, moving forward. I think the last thing we had was just talking a little bit about um, uh, middle schools in general. Um, being very, very special schools because it's really that pivotal age when kids are coming out of the uh, learning to read and going into the um, uh, learning, learning to read, reading to learn, um, coming into an age where they're um, uh, becoming a little bit more independent. Uh, they're not ready for high school yet, um, but those types of um, make or break years for middle school students make those, that focus in middle school intermediate level uh, really, really special. Um, we had taken just a, a kind of a brief look at, at some of the um, fields and things that you have across the street, um, maybe some of the opportunities there to, to look at uh, some expansion. Obviously, we talked, there's an idea about taking the existing baseball and softball field as a potential building area. Um, what could occur across the street? And 
in little chunks, a baseball field, a soccer field, two soccer fields. You know, how much of that wants to expand? And we'll certainly take a look at, um, you know, that area across the street for possible um, athletic space. And, and uh, it's a great commodity to have um, so close to your campus. So those are all um, beginnings of some ideas and some concepts that we can uh, share as we, uh, as we begin our work with you. A little bit about us. We're excited to get started. Uh, any other questions? Do you have any questions, comments? I, I guess I'll just share just for a point of clarity for, um, for I guess, the record. But I think one of a very important responsibility that, that I believe a school district and a school board needs to carry is not only to, to handle the day-to-day near-term responsibilities of the district, but also to have a vision. And having a vision doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we're going to go and do all these things and want to spend everybody's money. That's not what this is all about. I think failure to ha not have a longer-term vision Will, will bite us long term. If you, if you don't start considering some of the things like an aging school, like the middle school and all that now, effectively you're going to fight that and, it, and it's not gonna be a, a cheap, cheap battle. So, so behind this, this concept of feasibility study is, is to address a long-term opportunity, get some information, kick around some formalities of ideas and begin to evolve towards the what if and, and, and that kind of thing. So this is that, that formality in that process to give us an opportunity to take a look at what, what we could consider. Obviously, nothing's for free, but it's not, just so the message is clear, it's not like we're saying, hey, we're just going to start spending their, the school district's money to do all these grandiose things. That's not what's behind this. What's behind this is to become more knowledgeable, to explore the opportunities, to see where we see this district down the road 5, 10, 15 years from now. And I think failure to do that is, is, is not what we, we should be doing. So that's why we've hired the experts to help us through that initial stage of the process with this feasibility study. So thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Thoughts? Anybody? No? Okay. Appreciate it. Thank that. you very thank much. You. Have a good night. All right. Um, next order of business is the PFM bond refinancing. So, no, we have a student. Oh, and I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Service. Oh, that next? Oh, that's your stuff. Okay, sorry. Yep. Sorry. Uh, PFM is Jamie Doyle. She's our financial advisor from PFM, and she's going to go over some bond refinancing opportunities that we have and um, discuss that with the board for a possible um, vote next meeting. Jamie? Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening virtually. I believe you all have a copy of my presentation if, if you'd like to follow along. Uh, turning to page one, I always like to start off talking a little bit about market conditions. And, you know, if, if there's one uh, ray, ray of light in, in all of this uncertainty, it's that interest rates from a borrowing standpoint continue to hover near all time lows, which is uh, really advantageous. Not so great that they're also at all-time lows on the investment side of things, but we're, we're talking about a refinancing this evening uh, that's very attractive because of those all-time low rates. So if you look at page one, this is three snapshots of the same index. This is the municipal market data curve, and this is for a natural AAA credit rating. So this is not meant to be indicative of the rate you would receive. It's, it's simply to observe market trends. So that top snapshot shows us we're at the bottom line. Again, all time low interest rates, but the yield curve is still very, very flat, meaning the rate isn't all that different in year one as it is in year 30. That middle snapshot just shows you this index going all the way back to 1993 to give you a historic picture of interest rates. And I drew a red box on the far right hand side so that you can see uh, the volatility that we've experienced so far in, in calendar year 2019 and 2020. The bottom chart is just a blow up of the, that red box in the middle uh, to give you a, a bird's eye view of, of what's happened during the last two calendar years. And so you can see in that bottom chart, the spike upward that occurred uh, when the stay at home order around that time was issued in, in March of 2020. You can see how things settled back down and we hit the all time, all time low point in August of 2020. And we continue to hover very, very close to those levels today. So that's great news from a, a refunding opportunity standpoint. If you look at page number two, 
you'll see your existing debt portfolio that I monitor for you at all times for, for opportunities such as the one we're gonna to discuss tonight. And as always, the top half of the page is gross debt service, meaning principal and interest that you pay on your various issues annually. The bottom half is your local share of that debt service after the state reimbursement or AKA plan con that you were just discussing a little earlier is netted out. And so to, to revisit that plan con topic on these older issues, there's a line near the bottom of page two that says PE percent. That's the percent eligible of each of those issues. And so you can see your, your state reimbursement or state aid varies anywhere from 0% uh, to a high of 60.83% uh, on your share of the technical school issue. And so whatever the percentage is on the PE line, it then gets multiplied by your capital uh, account reimbursement fraction or CARF that's two more lines down. And so basically you get roughly half of whatever that, that, that PE percentage is or um, for example, on, on the series of 2016, you get a little over 12 cents on the dollar back from the state is how you would read that. So the two issues that we're discussing this evening are, are in columns two and three, your geo bond series of 2016 and series A of 2016. And we've been waiting to get close enough to the call date on these series. So also near the bottom of the page, there's a line labeled call date. You can see both of these bond issues are callable on May 1 of 2021, which is right around the corner and, and, and time to get started working on those. If you look at page three, this is a summary pretty much of the rest of the pages and, and this is the most important page in here. Uh, this is a snapshot of what this two-step refinancing opportunity could look like. And I'm always conservative this early on in, in my estimates. If we were having the competitive internet sale today, we'd do a little better than this. But in step one, we would refund the series of 2016. Uh, we would be looking to settle on that issue around April 15th. So a little bit before the call date, but that's, that's allowable. And uh, you can see, and, and we'll look at the, the, the mechanics of this in a minute, but we're suggesting changing your payment dates uh, about the fourth line down in box one. You currently pay principal each May 1, so toward the end of your fiscal year. And we're suggesting moving that up six months to November 1 within the same fiscal year. Uh, you're not earning anything on that money, so it, it helps your savings a little bit if you make the payments uh, a little bit earlier in your fiscal year. So we'll show you that in a minute. Step one would be for $9,995,000 uh, of refunding those 2016s. We, we wanna keep it under 10 million. You may recall from prior presentations, 10 million is a magic number with the IRS per calendar year. It gets you the lower bank qualified interest rates and it gets you the shorter five-year call features, which give you the flexibility to consider opportunities like, like this one uh, sooner. And so in step one, the estimated net savings to the school district is just under $369,000. And if you look down below in column six, you can see that the way I would structure these savings is roughly $99,000 in the current fiscal year, meaning that money is sitting in your general fund right now. And when your bill comes in the spring, it would be for $99,000 less than it otherwise would have been. And then about $38,000 in the upcoming budget year, and then uh, anywhere from uh, 12 to $17,000 in each of the remaining years. As always, we're not extending this debt at all. We're simply proposing to replace the old higher interest rates with today's all time low interest rates. Then we'd come back in column two for step two and refund the series A of 2016. We wanna separate these two sales by at least 15 days. Again, that's an IRS uh, condition, because if we do that, we can also do step two at the lower bank qualified rates and get the shorter five-year call feature, because we're going to meet some, some tests that are required to do that. But at the end of the day, in column three, you can see you'll be able to do $18.4 million worth of refinancing, all at BQ rates and five-year calls, you know, even though $18 million is, is greater than the $10 million limit, because we're going to, you know, meet some exceptions. On step two, the 2016 A bonds have, have lower interest rates 
to begin with than the 2016 bonds do. And so you can see their, their estimated net savings are about 185,000 and change. And if you look down below in column eight, you can see the way you would recognize the savings on step two is roughly $47,000 in the upcoming budget year. And then anywhere from uh, 3,000 to 18,000 in each of the remaining years. And so part of the test that we have to meet uh, is part of the reason why we're, we're stretching the savings out a little bit like that. And it will also well position you well uh, you can see in column 10, the combined annual savings between the two, it will help should you choose to proceed with some borrowings to address the, the issues you were just talking about in, in your feasibility study, this will help position you uh, to, to structure the cost of any potential new money needs for those projects. So in total between the two, conservative estimate of savings totals uh, $554,000 and change over the remaining lives of those issues. If you look at page four, you'll see a sample timeline. Tonight's a, an initial presentation on the opportunities. If you'd like to proceed, uh, you would authorize the finance team to get the paperwork in order with, with some sample motions that we're gonna look at in a minute at your February 10th voting meeting. And then that would allow us to get said paperwork in order and bring it back to your March 10th voting meeting in terms of, of resolutions, parameters, resolutions. And then that would allow us to, to lock in interest rates on, on step one uh, around March 11th, and then on step two around March 30th and each settlement would occur roughly 35 days after the sale. You'll notice all these dates say, or later after them, you know, if, if there's some disruption in the market or, or something happens, you know, we have the flexibility to adjust the timeline accordingly. If you look at page five, you'll see the two motions that I, I referenced that you could consider at your February 10th meeting if you so choose. The first motion would be just for step one, and it would authorize the finance team, which consists of myself as your independent financial advisor, uh, Medi Evans and, and Woodside as your bond counsel, and Andrews and Beard as your solicitor to get the paperwork in order to refund the 2016 bonds via, via competitive internet auction, which you've historically used. And it would set a minimum net savings target. And I'm suggesting based on historic benchmarks, that you set that minimum net savings target at 200,000. You know, we're, we're at levels greater than that right now. And as always, it's my job to save you every dollar that I can, but we have to set a minimum acceptable level and that will be built into that parameters resolution for your consideration in March. Likewise, there's a separate motion for step two that would authorize the finance team to get the paperwork in order for the 2016A refunding. And again, that's the one that doesn't work quite as well to begin with. So we're suggesting that minimum net savings target be $150,000. To quickly walk through the mechanics on page six, there's your 2016 bonds. If you do nothing, you'll keep making those payments. And you can see in column three, you have some pretty low interest rates to begin with. They range anywhere from 2% to 3%, um, but we can certainly Im improve on that at these all time low levels. Page seven just shows how much money we need to pay off the old 2016 bonds, principal and interest. And page eight shows you at, at today's conservative estimated rates in column three, which range from a 1.21% to a 2.17% on the long end. That's what generates the, the net savings to the district in column 10 which again was almost $369,000 over the life. This is a super sensitive opportunity right below the savings box. You can see the present value PV of 10 basis points. That's one tenth of 1% uh, moves your savings up or down, depending on which way interest rates are going, almost $95,000. So it doesn't take a whole lot to make this opportunity go away, but it also doesn't take a whole lot to make this opportunity a, a real home run. As always, we're showing column 10 as net savings to the district, meaning the state share is already netted out. You can see that in that very bottom box. Unfortunately, the state gets the same share of your savings as they pay on the 2016 bond. So you can see the state's gonna benefit by about $55,000.
And again, this assumes the November 1 principal payment dates that I alluded to at the beginning. So you'll, you'll pay off the entire issue about six months earlier uh, than you originally would have. And you know those interest savings compound over the life. If you look at page nine, there's the 2016A bonds if you do nothing. As I mentioned before, this has lower rates to begin with. These, these rates in column th three range from 2% to a 2.65% on the long end. Page 10 just shows how much money we need to pay the 2016A bonds off, principal and interest. And page 11, you can see likewise in column three, the, the conservative estimated rates range from 1.21% to a 2.21% on the long end, thus generating the savings you see in column 10. This one's a, a little bit less sensitive. Uh, the present value of one tenth of 1% is about $62,000 on, on this one. And likewise, you can see the state share of the savings in that very bottom box. So I will pause there. I know that was a, a ton of information. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have at this point. And I would just like to, to commend the board and the administration. Um, part of what gives you this opportunity to save uh, this money and, and see these attractive savings level is your excellent credit rating. So you have a credit rating from Moody's. It's a double A3 with a stable outlook. And some of the things that Moody's referenced in your last credit rating report uh, were your ample reserves and liquidity levels. So, you know, the credit rating agencies during these uncertain and challenging times are, are you know, certainly um, really studying everyone's financials and, and how COVID is affecting revenues and expenditures. And should you choose to proceed, uh, Bobby will have to go through a, a, a grueling one hour credit rating call, which, which I'll be on and, and helping with. Um, but the rating agency is, is more focused on cash position than ever during these challenging times. So again, I, I know it's difficult, but kudos to the board and administration uh, for, for maintaining those reserves and that credit rating is, is critical, not just for this refinancing opportunity, but should you choose to proceed with the projects in, in your feasibility study and have new money needs, that credit rating is, is going to be even more critical to making sure uh, the cost of borrowing is as low as it possibly can be on any future transactions as well. So again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Jamie, this is Chris, thank you for this. Um... Oh, I just want to throw just a kind of a semi-obvious question, certainly to me. You presented this so well, I'm just trying to ponder what's the downside. Is there, is there even a reason why someone could make a, a, a logical argument why not to do this? Well, th there's not much of a downside when we're at all-time low interest rate and we're approaching the call date. Because, you know, once you get past the call date, every day that goes by that you're paying the old higher rates mean there, means there's a smaller and smaller amount of time left on the issue to, to lower the rate on. So you sort of bleed savings a little bit after you get past the call date. Um, the, the only thing that I can think of is if, if you had an awesome crystal ball and, and you thought rates were gonna go lower, that would be the only reason. But again, we're, we're at all time low interest rate. So uh, I, I would not count on that. Yeah, I think my crystal ball is right next to my winning lottery ticket numbers. Mine too. Mine too. <laughs> no, that was a great assessment. I, and it just seems very logical and I appreciate that response. And I don't know if, if Bobby, you had anything you wanted to share? Um, your view of this? Just that Jamie and I looked at this today and um, she discussed moving up the date to November and we saved Jamie, how much was it? 160. Uh, yes. $160,000 just by moving it ahead six months. So I think that's a good um, option for the district to do. It's within the same fiscal year. And actually cash flow, November is better for cash flow anyway than May. Okay. So then this is the most aggressive we could be with this opportunity is what, what I think you're saying? Yes. Okay. Jamie, you would agree, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then we'll take this up. I guess I'll just ask if there's any other questions or thoughts. So we'll take this up in a formal sense next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jamie, and your team. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. All right.
Uh, next order of business, we have student support services presentation. As uh, Mr. Chris Johns will have the floor. All right, Mr. Ryan has my presentation up. Uh, one of the several roles I do within the district is I work with our intervention specialists. I work with our guidance counselors. Um, there's a lot of interaction at times with kids going in out of a learning program, moving back and forth. So um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview on some of these uh, some of the services that we offer here in the district. And I think it's actually pretty relevant to seeing some of those things that students were saying about getting supports and having things available to them within the district. We are by no means perfect, but it was really nice to, to hear it from the students in the video that we saw earlier on uh, to connect some of these things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of these things are things that you all as board members may not even know happen on, on a regular basis. This is just a brief staffing review, just so you all are aware what kind of staff we have in each building. If you remember, I think it was two years ago, we added a last full-time intervention specialist. So now we have one intervention specialist at each building, which is great because they are dedicated to that building full-time and they work specifically with students at that level. Uh, the primary school, we have one full-time counselor and one full-time intervention specialist at Liberty Valley. One full-time counselor, one full-time intervention specialist. At the middle school, we have two full-time counselors one full-time intervention specialist. And at the high school, we have three and a half uh, equivalent full-time counselors and one uh, full-time intervention specialist. As you can see at the middle in the high school, there is a greater need for counseling services, also things related to scheduling and a lot of other issues that go on as our students get older. Next slide. Uh, and then this just gives you some ratios. Uh, what we follow is ASCA, which stands for the American School Counselor Association. They recommend a ratio of approximately one to 250, uh, one counselor to about 250 students. Uh, the primary school, uh, it's about one to 519, one to 510, one to 246, and then one to 183. If you include our intervention specialists in these ratios, we are, think, I think, well within the recommendations of the uh, American School Counselor Association that we do provide uh, definite support uh, to all of our students when it comes to uh, needs within our buildings. Uh, this is very small. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. Obviously, any good program or any good district, we have a counseling mission statement. And to summarize a lot of what this statement says is that there is a lot of collaboration. We look at areas of personal, social, academic, and career preparation, whether that's getting kids ready for college or whether that's getting them ready for the workforce. There's a lot of personal social things, trying to be culturally aware, make them productive members of society. I know one of the things that we talk about administratively a lot is what is our goal when a student walks across, uh, they get their diploma, they walk across that stage at the end. We want them to be good citizens. And that means uh, obviously being prepared academically, being prepared from a career perspective, where are they going? And also that social emotional aspect that we talk a lot about in personalized learning. And a lot of those things are summarized within this, uh, our mission statement. Some of the roles our counselors and intervention specialists provide are varied. They provide support. Uh, they obviously advocate for, for children and for students all throughout their, their careers, whether it's a kindergarten student or a high school senior that's graduating uh, and leaving our system. They collaborate with a lot of different people, whether that's a teacher, whether that's a uh, an outside agency, whether that's an administrator, whether that's a parent, whether it's a sibling, whether it's, there's all kinds of collaborations that happen with our counselors and intervention specialists. They plan, they facilitate, they connect to communities. They're members of our SAP team, uh, which we have at each of our buildings. We have that structure in place. Student assistance program is what SAP stands for. They develop chapter 504 plans, which uh, is, is structures and things that are in place to help some of our students that may not be necessarily identified as special education students, but it's something that they work with. Uh, a big one is they provide staff and adult support. You know, it's not only our kids that need support within our, our programs, our intervention specialists I know are huge supports for not only kids, but the adult and the staff that they work with every day. Uh, and another one, really that takes up a lot of their time at certain parts of the year is their test prep and they help with organization, whether that's Keystones, uh, PSSAs, PSATs, SATs, APs, NOCTIs. We have all kinds of tests that our students take, whether they're standardized, by the, they're required by the state, whether they're nationalized tests like the PSAT, the SAT, the APs, uh, 
we're very busy. We have counselors that sometimes will spend months planning, counting, organizing, taking care of all of the testing needs throughout the district. You heard me mention ASCA, which stands for the American School Counseling Association. These are three areas of focus that we tend to look at and organize what some of our roles and duties are for our school counselors. And in, in, by an extension, our intervention specialists, their academic career, uh, there's a personal social realm, which we, we talk a lot about social emotional learning. So that's where that falls in. Next slide. Under academic, these are all kinds of different things that our, our staff provides. Interventions for our struggling students. They're members of child study teams at each of our buildings, which a child study team meets to help identify uh, needs of struggling students and things and ways and ideas that we can kind of come up with as administrators and teachers to help our students. Uh, scholarship coordination at the high school is, is a huge undertaking. And we have a, one of our counselors spends a lot, a lot of their time throughout the, the school year coordinating these scholarships making sure that this, they get in the right students' hands, keeping connections to the agencies that provide them. Uh, again, you heard me talk about standardized testing. We talked about proficiency rates. You've heard us do presentations here in the past. They help organize that information. Uh, a huge one right now we're talking, especially at the high school, about credit requirements for graduation. We're now going through and auditing kids who we gotta make sure you're getting all your credits. We're making sure you're on schedule, making sure you're on time. All of these things happen by the, through the attention of, of our specifically our guidance counselors at the high school. Scheduling assistance at the middle and high school levels. Again, that kind of falls in line with making sure you get the correct credits, you're taking the correct courses uh, in order to graduate. There's testing roles, they monitor grades, uh, they provide information for our Danville High School profile sheet, which is included in your packet, which is a really amazing summary of what our students in grades nine through nine through 12 are doing uh, and, and you know, it's, it's really a powerful document. If you take some time and you're able to look at it outside of the board meeting, there's a lot of things our students do. Uh, it lists a lot of where our students go to college. It talks about their performance on AP tests. It talks about our standardized test performance. Um, and all that information comes from organization by our counselors and by our staff that they are able to put that together. Uh, that profile sheet also goes out with student transcripts and also with application, or I'm sorry, sometimes colleges will recommend or request those when students are applying to a school. Next hey, up. Chris, real yep. quick, sorry. Where, this is incredible. Hmm? Where, I mean, where do we, do we have this accessible? Does this come around? Like, this uh, is, I would think it'd be accessible. I have to double check on the guidance yeah. website at the high school, but that really is a, it's, we do that every year. Um, and we, it, it takes a little bit from the previous year in order to gather the information to get your AP test scores and to get all of those things. But it's really an amazing document that summarizes everything that our students do. Um, again, it's, it, it's pretty amazing. It talks a little bit about um, even breakdowns, like how are we doing on our AP tests, which our students perform amazingly on that. And I don't have it right in front of me, so I can't yeah. give you details, but it really, really talks about uh, in, in great depth, the academic performance of, of our students. Yeah, I love this. This is just a two two page wonderful summary of, of data, and it just it really exemplifies what all the good things we're doing here, mm -hmm. and have been doing here, not just now, but even in the yep. over and the we years. We get an updated one of those this, every year. This is great, awesome. And then, again, that comes from information that our counselors organize. That comes through, uh, you know, a counselor is, is uh, you know a point of contact from the, from the college board for AP. There's another point of contact for Keystone. So all of those things. Um, they all happen through organization of our people that are, that are doing these things. Under career, uh, I'll talk a little bit about smart futures in the next slide. We have a chapter 339 plan, which is just mostly recently reviewed in the summer of 2019. That includes a lot of the career readiness things that you'll hear us talk about, the CTEs that uh, Dr. Bickhart at times will talk about in different, uh, some of our different programs that we have within the, within the high school. Again, testing roles that kind of overlaps at times from academic into career. They do push in lessons throughout the district. Uh, we have a co-op placement uh, teacher who's specifically responsible for that at the high school. Uh, that could be a whole presentation in and of itself, what uh, co-ops and some of what our students do at the high school in order to earn credit and then to also prepare themselves uh, for a career in different, uh, different areas. There's career days at Liberty Valley. There's eighth grade career presentations that happen at the middle school. There's a job career fair at the high school every year. 
We work with our Columbia Montour Chamber of Commerce. We also have a transition program for our special education students and students that are transitioning from uh, the, the, the school world into the real world. And these are all just examples of career things that our counselors work with um, and help facilitate with our students. Just a quick summary of Smart Futures. Uh, some of you may know what is Smart Futures. Uh, two years ago, we started Smart Futures. It's for students in our grades K through 12. They each have specific accounts and they complete online modules. And this helps us meet the requirements of the Department of Education's Chapter 339 Career Readiness Plan. So what we used to do was at each level, our counselors would go in, they would do, uh, they would do lessons in the classroom and they would literally like keep orange folders for every student throughout the district. Uh, where they would compile artifacts. This Smart Futures has everything online for us. It coordinates it. It makes life so much easier for us to meet this requirement. So again, Smart Futures is something that our counselors help organize and make sure happens over the course of the time when our students are in our, our system. And the social emotional learning aspect, some of these supports, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but this is just several different areas and things that are happening within our district uh, as it relates to the personal social and the social emotional learning aspect of what our, our students go through. Uh, there's push in lessons that happen in classrooms, uh, happens a little more at the elementary level. I know specifically our guidance counselors do lessons on a regular basis. They're a specialist, just like an art, art teacher, a music teacher, a PE teacher. Our students get lessons on a regular basis. There's intervention groups K to 12. Our intervention specialists are doing in person. They've been doing virtual intervention groups, um, much like the Zooms that we're all doing or Google Meets. Our student our uh, intervention specialists are doing them virtually when they haven't been able to uh, have our students in person. Also regular check-ins, whether that's daily check-ins with some students, whether that's weekly check-ins, whether that's intermittent check-ins, they all happen for our students uh, by our counselors and by our intervention specialists. There's a lot of special education crossover with some of these support groups, whether that's emotional support, autistic support, individual counseling. Uh, our counselors and our intervention staff do a lot of connections with our special education students throughout the district at, at all of our buildings. They also focus on attendance. They talk truancy issues. You heard me say before they're on SCP teams. Uh, they do outreach in times of full remote and hybrid virtual learning. Again, it's by no means perfect, but these, these people within our district know people that need the support on the outside and they do their best to try and connect with them on a regular basis, especially in area, uh, times of long breaks where we have been off for long periods of time. Uh, I know we're in the initial stages of the CSTAG threat assessment, comprehensive school threat assessment guidelines. Uh, our counselors have been, I think it was just Dr. Boyer, right? Just yesterday we had like that training was happening. Okay. So our counselors are involved in, in being along with our administrators in being trained in this level of threat assessment. We have the safe to say uh, something anonymous reporting system, which we've had for, this is our second or third year in that program, it's our third year. Um, and again, that's an anonymous system where students can report things uh, that they think are going on and then we investigate them administratively. Yes, at times counselors are involved in investigations because they have relationships with our students. So they are, are connections uh, into our classrooms. Uh, under Head Start, I know Linda's not here, but she talked about some of her virtual support programs and her parent trainings that are happening. Um, also, the Second Step curriculum is, is uh, another area that we've, we've delved into when it comes to social emotional learning and supports. There's just a list of several of the partnerships, and again, by no means an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but these are, are uh, groups in the community that I know, uh, K through 12 at some level, we have partnerships and there have been connections. CMSU is a huge part of what we do. We lean on them for support when our students and our families need support. Northumberland County Human Services, as you heard Dr. Boyle say, we also are in Northumberland County. So we do overlap two different counties. So not only Montour, but Northumberland County. Uh, behavioral Rehab Services, uh, the Good Samaritan Mission, the Women's Center, Montour County Children and Youth, the Gay House, uh, Geisinger Evangelical, we do a program called, a huge program uh, called Christmas Friends around the holidays in order to support our families. 
and again, there's numerous co-op opportunities that our students work with on, on a regular basis and are out in the community. Challenges. These are a lot of challenges. And, and, and you heard us say, we talk all the time about how difficult of a time we're in, about how stressful this is, about how hard this is. But these are challenges that even in a normal year, things happen. But even in a year like this, where we haven't had our students in the classrooms on a regular basis are very hard. Staying connected with our students in a virtual remote, remote teaching environment. Getting students in their family services is even harder when you can't always meet with them in person. You count on Google Meet, you count on them being there virtually, um, and they're not always the most accessible. Uh, the amount of time that testing takes during parts of the academic year, that's an ongoing thing. That's a challenge that I know. Uh, it always seems that the testing falls into some of the busiest social times of the year for our students in the spring when there's so many things going on, when you're trying to coordinate scholarships, when you're trying to get keystones ready. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort from our, our counseling staff. Uh, adjusting course offerings, always looking at scheduling, figuring out what, what uh, do we need this many sections of a course at the high school? Can we get away with this? How are we using our staff? So counselors are involved with helping organize, uh, organize and, and look at our courses providing therapeutic services, preparing students for an ever-changing world, communicating with staff, being available when needed. What are the long-term effects of virtual and remote learning? All of these things can be mentally draining. We're all mentally drained every day. Uh, we come in every day, we go home tired. Our counseling staff, our intervention staff, also mentally drained because not only are they dealing with this, but they're dealing with it on a remote level. So I, I would speak, I talk with a lot of them, almost some of them on a daily basis. Um, it's hard for them as it's hard for all of us. Again, this is not a, of course, an exhaustive list, but these are just a list of challenges and the things that we face all the time. And last but not least, I just want to include a slide for those at home that may be watching it on YouTube or you may want to go back and revisit this. Uh, you can contact any one of our schools. As I told you, there's an intervention specialist at every school. There's a counselor at every school. Most of our families will know who these people are. Sometimes they don't know that these options are available to us. So we just wanted to review a lot of these things and, and show you as a board, kind of take a step back. We're talking about you know building projects and long-term planning and all those things that are happening, which are also super important. But we want you to know on a day-to-day -day basis, these are some of the things that a specific section of our staff, mainly support staff, counselors, intervention specialists, how they work with our teachers, how they work with our students, and how they work with our families. So. Anybody has any questions or any comments or anything that they, they want to add to that? I'll uh, just throw this into the discussion. It doesn't have to be answered here, but but as you, you take a look at all these things, and it's tremendous. I mean, the list is is, is even more than I, I would have envisioned. I'd, I'd like to just throw out there, if there's any need for a focus area or additional resources or something that we can help facilitate, something that might be that one glaring thing that keeps you up at night, you know, think about that. I'd, I'd be happy to, to get into any kind of conversations to support that, that view because there's a lot there. And, and, and I just know that there's many things that many moving parts right now, but if there's anything that we could do to help support whatever that means, I don't know what that means, just saying it, it's not just words, but if there's something there, please like, don't, don't let it go. I wish we could address this. Let's, well, I'd say we let's as proactively do it and see what that means. We as administrators, and also the, the superintendent, you know, we, we really appreciate that you're listening to these things and you're looking at it. And I think one of the biggest things that we did several years ago was that additional intervention specialist. I can't tell you how important it is to have one intervention specialist at a building working with a specific grade span, K to two, three to five, six to eight, nine to 12. It's so, so helpful. So we, we really appreciate that. We added an intervention specialist previous year and then one this year to make a full complement of four. Yeah. And it has made a huge difference at every level. Is that enough? I don't have to answer that now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, this is this is this is real life stuff. This gets to the heart of what we're all about: is taking care of our kids. You know, well, you know, and that's part of levels. the vision for the feasibility study as well: is how do we handle more um, supports outside of academic supports for students? Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Any other? Anybody else? Any comments? Concerns? Thoughts? All right, thank you. That was awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, moving along. Next order of business, school property and supplies. Uh, with deep cleaning and finalizing auditorium are the two items there. Well, actually, there's three. Finalizing maintenance building. 
Okay, just because it had been questioned about deep cleaning process, it is something that we do quite often, honestly, or our custodians do. The process entails that you would be um, taking all touch surfaces or wiped down using a special disinfectant product. That means hand doorknobs, handles, um, all those various different things. It's not just a sanitizing thing. It's much stronger disinfecting uh, and a very good chemical for cleaning uh, in regard to the virus. All our flat surfaces are wiped down with that disinfectant, desktops, desk chairs, countertops, shelving, uh, all those different things. The vinyl floor tile areas are wet mopped after touch and flat surfaces are cleaned with disinfectant product. All carpeted areas are vacuumed. All restrooms are thoroughly cleaned again with the disinfectant, touch surfaces, sinks, bowls, partitions, floors, the whole works. Uh, all the areas uh, when we go for a true deep clean and we close the building are then fogged using vital oxide. And I'll be honest, there are times that we'd have them do that at night as well, just because we know our cases are going up a little bit and we just are taking precautions. The classrooms, the corridors, the office, everything is used. Uh, vital oxide is the only product kept, found to be safely used in fogging application. It is expensive. When we do this, it is very expensive, but we are using the best you can use. So keep in mind that vital oxide fogging claims to be the only product needed without needing to clean the rooms beforehand. We do the extra step. We do clean our rooms beforehand. We do not just rely on the fogging. We actually do a thorough cleaning and then the fogging. So in a nutshell, uh, although it sounds simple and pretty basic, it is a lot of work. And there's a lot of time and energy that goes into every little nook and cranny. So kudos to our custodians and our maintenance department for keeping our buildings as safe as possible. Rick, real quick on that. So that is the deep cleaning is, is done as an uh, as needed basis and then periodically or just maybe no. clarify that point. The, the deep cleaning. Uh, all the touch surfaces, all the areas that using the disinfectant is done every day okay. in the areas. The fogging is done on a regular basis. Playground equipment is fogged every day. So it, it's done often enough that, you know, when we do have issues, closing a day instead of three can be done. Okay. But the point there is very proactive is what exactly. I was hearing you said. Yeah. I just want to clarify that. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have finalizing the auditorium. I'm going to take, take the next two items, oh, yes. finalizing the auditorium and finalizing the maintenance building. So on the next board meeting, uh, February 10, we will have two invoices which will finalize the um, additions and all of the construction in the high school and the auditorium. The final payment will be a total of $98,000 that I'd ask you to approve. We were holding off until we got clarification that the system was working properly and can um, approve those payments and said we are ready to go and everything's working properly. So that will be on the next board meeting. And then finalizing the maintenance building. We have um, the final invoices for MidPen Engineering on the next board meeting agenda as well for approval. Once they are approved, we have a small little expense that we still need to buy. And then once that's done, we'll be completely done with the maintenance building and all construction finally um, that we currently have going on will be done. Um, so the maintenance building original budget was $1,220,129. With the payment and estimated little expense of $900 that's still yet to be purchased. The final expense will be $1,260,904. So it's over budget by $40,775, which is 3.34%. You might think that's a lot, but remember we had the asbestos removal and hazardous waste with all the paint that we had to do. And that cost $31,429. So really, if that was not the case, we would be right on target with our budget and only off 0.77% for budget to actual. So it was the asbestos and the hazardous materials that put us over. 
So when Jamie was talking about saving funds, so I'm going to talk about the last couple of years of the district and what we've done with construction projects and renovations. So we did the high school addition, the renovations to the high school. We did the athletic field, lighting, fencing, press box, field house. Um, we did renovations to both of them. Field house, we only did a little. Tennis courts, wrestling room, and then the maintenance building. All total came to just over $19.5 million. So how did we fund that? We had about $11.8 million in bonds. We um, used $5.7 million in our general operating fund balance. So when Jamie says to retain some, don't forget the last couple of years, we used some of that money. So I just wanted to let you know that. The interest um, that we, in, we invested some of that money um, while we weren't using it, uh, we earned interest about $346,000. We had a donation of 200,000. We did have a refund um, of 25,000 from a vendor. And then we used our capital reserve, mostly for the maintenance building, of $1.4 million. So I'm rounding there, but that's the $19.5 million for the projects over the last couple of years. So out of the district money without borrowing, we did the 5.7 and the 1.4. So we're used, we have used quite a bit of district money for, for these projects. So I just wanted to let the board know that because a lot of the board wasn't here when those decisions were made. But it's nice to get a construction project finalized and not have any more payments for a little bit anyway. That's what, that's what I refer to as finish, not done. Done means there's more to do. Finish means whoosh, cross it off the list. Yes. Finish. Finished. Finished. Almost finished. Almost finished. We're kind close. Done. All right. Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. All right. So uh, moving along, nothing on items seven through nine. Finances next up. Tax collector resolution. So that one's mine as well. Okay. Um, on the next board agenda, which would be 210 for a voting meeting, there will be a resolution um, and taxpayer uh, tax collector agreements for three of our townships um, that have currently decided that they do not want to collect school district taxes any longer. Uh, they are willing to collect the county and the township taxes, so they will still be the tax collector for those. But for the school district, what that means is we're going to deputize myself slash the school district to collect these taxes um, on behalf of the district. I'm also on the board going to have an agreement, which I hope is approved, to move forward with a web payment option for tax collectors uh, or taxpayers for those three municipalities that the district will be collecting for. It's no cost to the district. There is a cost to the taxpayer, but if you pay by check, it's very minimal. It's actually a $1.50 flat fee for anything. So it's a good option for taxpayers um, and will save a little time um, in our office as well. Okay. And uh, next order of business is the CSIU general operating budget. Is that you as well? Or No, I can talk to it though. Okay. Um, the IU has put forward the operating budget. They will be wanting a vote on that either February or March, and we can invite them to come speak to that if we choose. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next item is personnel. Um, Geisinger Pediatric Dental Mobile Program. Did you know we have a flyer in here? Yeah, the board members do have a flyer. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Mangus. Uh, for many, many years, he had been the district's dentist that took care of our children. Uh, he has since passed, and we will miss him greatly. Again, our nurses have come to the forefront to help us in looking at ways to address dental needs for our children, and they have found that Geisinger has a pediatric dental mobile program whose focus is to provide the children with dental preventive services at a convenient location, which would be at our buildings, and to help lower the risk for developing tooth decay. 
On the dental unit, a state licensed dental professional will provide preventative dental services, which may include an exam, hygiene instructions, fluoride treatment, x-rays if needed, dental cleanings, sealants, and even uh, silver diamine fluoride. Uh, they're not to be the dental home for these students, but this way we can assure that our students who need dental assistance are getting some, uh, and then they will also help the children find dentists for their home dentist. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health mandates dental exams for children in grades kindergarten, third, and seventh grade. And our nurses are proposing to offer the pediatric dental mobile program to grades one, or K1, 3, 4, 7, and 8, of course, with parent permission and our, uh, as our spring dental exams. So that covers all these students that may have been missed due to COVID in the spring. So uh, Geisinger has availability, and we're going to be having on the next meeting to approve uh, taking this service. And then if, if this moves forward, then we'll just communicate to the community how the program will work and the opportunity for them to participate in those kind of things. Like yeah, the nurses will take care of that with things that will be sent home and all the information will be on the website. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, moving along, next area tonight is transportation. I have that one as well. So the transportation subsidy, uh, PDE, told us that we had to choose as a district between one of two options. Option one, the bus contractors will certify their variable costs, variable costs which include fuel, wages, only if the bus contractor did not pay their bus drivers while they did not provide transportation services, tolls, which is NA for us, maintenance, and other. Um, so what option one is saying is a school district must certify that to PDE that they will pay the contractor what they would have gotten paid if it had been a regular year of education, less those variable costs. Uh, the bus contractor will be, be, will be reimbursed or paid based off of those calculations. Um, we will have to report our actual days to PDE uh, that we transported. So it's um, multiple calculations there, but we will get reimbursed the same as we did in the prior year, which is the 1920 year, which is a full year uh, reimbursement if we go with option one. Option two would be to the school districts calculate and pay bus contractors based on the actual transportation data and the days of service for the 2021 year. And then the district would only get reimbursed their percentage based off of those days. So those are the two options. I did do the calculations. I asked the bus contractors to um, provide me with the variable costs. I'm pleased to know that um, most of them continued to pay their bus drivers um, while we were not in session. Um, I did provide calculations to the finance committee and I can share them if you would like, um, but it is Ricky's and my recommendation that we move forward and um, go with option one since the bus contractors did pay for their wages to their employees. If we go with option two, the bus contractors will be out quite a bit of money um, since they did continue to pay their employees. They're trying to retain staff. So that's my op my recommendation. Um, Keston, do you have anything to add? Because I did share uh, additional information with the finance committee. Yeah, no, I I think that's a fair synopsis. I do. Did all bus driver or all all of them pay? No. No. So. So the the, the, the bus that contractor that did not pay will have to. Um, any bus contractors that did not pay will have to subtract out the wages. Okay, so they won't get... They, they will not get, get reimbursed for those. That's okay. correct. Perfect. Thank you. And I already have um, those forms and verified that um, that was the case. So. so option one would be the ones that did not do the right thing and pay their folks. No, no. Option one, um, will everybody... We have to do all or none. So option one, the people that 
paid their employees do not have to subtract out the wages. The people that did not pay their employees will need to subtract out their wages for this calculation. Yep. So okay. basically with option one, we're paying the bus contractors what they have honestly spent. So you're making spent. them whole. As I we're trying to make them whole, that's okay. right. And okay. you know, most of them are small businesses. I think that's the right way to go okay. to support them because we do, they do a lot for us yep. and we'd be lost without them. And this does decrease our cost because they, we did not pay them for fuel or maintenance during that period of time that we were off, which was 30 days. So 30 days of the fuel cost. Um, as of January 15th, that was 30 days. It could be more by the end of the year. Um, so it's variable cost per day. Um, so that might be calculated if we have to go virtual again, but we have the calculation now to do so. Um, any other questions? No. No. Uh, this will be on the board for a vote on February 10th as well. Okay. okay. Any other questions from anybody else from the board? Comments? Thoughts? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, next order of business, board concerns, and any items or comments, et cetera, for the next meeting's agenda? Anything from the board at this time? Around the room, Carol. Anything? No, we're good. You good, Jen? You still out there, Porta? Doctor, I'm Uwasa? still here. I don't have anything, Chris. I'm good. All right, thanks. I just want to make sure it's virtual. Sometimes yep. I think past that because I don't see your face. Corda, Doctor, you asked any anything from you tonight? No, I'm fine. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, and um, I just I, I don't want to occupy time, but I think can't be said enough and it's been touched on I, I just the more time I spend and really finding myself engaged in some of the day-to-day -day stuff I've learned just out of circumstance and out of, out of need um, I can't say enough to to the team we've built in this community I, I guess I've never really thought as much about it as I have in my current role but it can't be said enough the the the, the challenges that are maintained the um the discourse and opinions that get sent around through a lot of different avenues and all that, but I, I, I do stand behind what what I said many times along the way that at the at the that the foundation of all that I've seen and what I see us do in this community in this school district is continue to put our children, the health and well being of our teachers and everybody first. And sometimes it may not appear like that to others, but I can say firsthand from my 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 stance, I've gotten involved in quite a bit here. Um, it's just amazing and how much and how dynamic the times are right now and the, the amount of proactive and reactive things that this community is doing and maintaining is just, it's just amazing. And I want to thank everybody for that. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank you all. Very incredible. Okay. I'm going to step down off my soapbox and, um, open it up for the final public comment period, unless there's another board comment it kind of just moved along. No. All right. Um, Another public comment period, if there's anybody outside the room, because I don't see anybody waving their hand in the room. Um, Jeff, anybody out online? In, nobody nope. online? They all, nope. they all went to bed? We're all alone now. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Okay. All right. With that said, I guess we move to um, the adjournment, which is kind of sort of one of my favorite times of the night. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? No motion. I'll second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay, motion carries. Thank you.